Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. I'm sure there'll be a few more people that will join us in the next few minutes. But um, I think we'll get started. So yeah, thank you and welcome to this online event called Collective and Interdependent Approaches to Art Making. My name is Lucy Keeney. I work as a learning and participation manager at Autograph. We're a gallery based in East London and we specialize in exploring issues related to diversity, human rights and social justice through photography. The event tonight is a response to a wonderful exhibition we have on at the moment called Have You Ever Had by Sharif Basord, which runs until the 28th of August. Um, but don't worry if you haven't seen the exhibition as we'll begin the event with a film which will introduce Sharif, his exhibition and Project Artworks, an organisation who have supported his practice. So our panellists tonight are Sonia Bue, who's a multi-form neurodivergent artist, writer and consultant. Tim Corrigan, artist and creative director of Project Artworks. Anna Farley, autistic artist, socially engaged practitioner and founder of Autography, hosted by Photofusion. And she's joined by her home support tonight, who is Helen Farley. And we've also got Thompson Hall, resident artist at Action Spaces Cockpit Art Studios. So the conversation is going to be chaired by my colleague Ali Issa, who is also a learning and participation manager at Autograph. Um, and the event is going to last around an hour and a half and will be finishing by eight o'clock. If you have any questions, please do go ahead and put them in the chat and we can put those to our panellists in the last part of the event. Um, so, okay, so let's begin now with our video and just in case you don't know when people are sharing their screens if you choose side by side mode you'll still be able to see the panelists and our BSL interpreters so I'm just going to say goodbye now and we really hope you enjoy the event this evening thank you very much Project Artworks is a collective of neurodiverse artists and activists, and we're based in Hastings. We want to see people with complex support needs brought into the heart of cultural and civic life, and so that they can see themselves reflected in the programming and audiences of cultural organisations. The neurodivergent artists within the programme are a very uh, diverse group, some who identify as artists, others who don't. Alongside the creative programme, uh, we run the Support Collective. The Support Collective brings together people who have lived experience of caring for uh, those who have complex support needs. Uh, its aims are to help people navigate the complexity of support systems within social care and to improve those outcomes in social care. Sharif Pasord has been working with Project Artworks for a long time. He is now 27 years old. He is autistic and I first started working with Sharif uh, when he was uh, very young at his primary school when we ran some school projects there. I really got to know him uh, in around 2010 when he was part of a project that we called In Transit which was um, a film project where we paired filmmakers with young people who were in transition between uh, education and adult social care. Autism is um, what's in your body, um, is, some, is a condition, it's a disability, and when you have autism it can make you a little bit anxious sometimes. Um, I've got an autism, haven't I? I've got autism too. After we made the In Transit film, things got quite difficult for Sharif and a lot of uh, support systems and placements for him broke down uh, and he ended up spending some time in hospital. Because of the relationship that we had, which was really great during the making of In Transit, the In Transit film, the family contacted me just prior to Sharif's discharge and uh, asked me whether we could work together again. All of Sharif's work is autobiographical to some extent. All of it is about himself, his place in the world, 
Sharif is an existentialist in the sense that he is always questioning what his place is, how he's different, how that affects him, what's his role. Sharif had a really uh, prolific kind of output of work over a sort of six or seven year period. And what's on show here at the exhibition is a real cross-section of that work. It encompasses lots of the different aspects of his practice. So there's drawings, uh, and that's really Sharif's instinctive art-making process, one that actually is, is functional for him because it's a way of reflecting and understanding the past and also thinking about the future and always kind of balancing negative things with positive things. So it, it was a process that he sort of underwent. And as he made these drawings, he would narrate them, so he'd perform them. So there was a kind of an action that went with them that was kind of uh, cathartic, I think, to some extent. This is one of Sharif's drawings uh, called Nightmares and Dreams. These are all nightmares that he had or things that he thought of as nightmares. And so things that are in here are um, a hospital that he didn't like, um, some, some moments of conflict. Um, this, was a, <laughs> this was a dream about a nightmare, I'd say, about me driving him over the edge of a cliff on a bus. And so, on the other on the other hand, this is um, these are really um, positive uh, things. He dreamt that we went on holiday to we were going on holiday to America together, and this was the woman at the uh, baggage area, and he, he she cleared her throat, <laughs> and that was uh, exciting for him. This is the Holby City cast ensemble. Sharif is really interested in um, the body, medical issues, um, hospitals, and so it's a Holby City is a big part of his life. And unfortunately, it's just ended. I think after about thirty years. At the time, Sharif was very anxious, and this was a way of um, sort of slowing down and doing something really methodical and meaningful for him, but also sort of a distraction from his anxiety. So. The, the, the painting, which is amazing as a sort of work of art, also had this sort of function, which was about his well-being, and that was the process. My role has always just been to sort of stand back and admire, but also just to be there to sort of support Sharif and to um, collaborate in, in small ways, you know. So the film, The Mask, was obviously um, a collaborative process but one that he always led on. And actually, because Sharif has a director and writer credit on the film, we have to measure that in a different way for someone like Sharif. How does Sharif write that film? Well, how he wrote that film was that he performed the entire script in a single monologue in a recording studio. He didn't write it down, but he just, he just said it in one go. He's really honest about the way that he makes work, what he talks about. And I think that, you know, it made me realize sort of how afraid I was in terms of what I make, because we're always kind of considering what someone thinks of the work or how we're going to be judged by it. And Sharif is completely fearless in the sense that he just doesn't consider that. He, Sharif operates from a what I need perspective and his work is a way of understanding his life. You know, that's what's really, exciting about it, that it sort of reflects this truth of his life. Okay, hey, thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing that, uh, Livy and Lucy. Um, so as, as Lucy mentioned at, at the beginning, uh, my name's Ali. I'm also part of the, the learning and participation uh, team at, at Autograph. Um, and uh, we're gonna move off, uh, having seen the video, we're gonna move into 
um, uh, panel discussion now, and we're really, really happy to have uh, Sonia and Thompson uh, and Anna joining us, uh, and Tim, of course, who you've already met in the video a little bit. Um, and I think um, just to kind of um, set this up, really, um, Tim mentioned so many really interesting things about Sharif's um, work and uh, the work that we have on at, at Autograph at the moment, um, his exhibition. And um, it's also been part of a three year project um, where we've been collaborating with Project Artworks at Autograph. And um, it's been an incredible journey, really, um, for us to take uh, kind of our practice and our work, which has been for many years looking at issues around uh, identity, race, rights and representation and to kind of think about that through the lens of uh, neurodiversity um, and, and disability and it's uh, it's been I, I would say a really kind of landmark um, kind of uh, process for us um, and the other thing to kind of mention about it is that uh, Sharif's show opened just before the pandemic um, and had to close uh, with the gallery shutting so there was this kind of incredible uh, moment where uh, Sharif's show went on and it was the end of this kind of um, incredible journey as I said that we'd been on uh, over three years and then it was kind of curtailed but it stayed on um, and uh, it was kind of uh, up in the gallery space over the whole of this last period since we've um, until we've reopened um, and I think for me Sharif's work was also it was an incredible kind of statement. It was kind of very prescient about what was all the changes that were kind of happening uh, in the world around us, um, not just in the kind of direct sense around kind of uh, health uh, and, um, you know, kind of sneezing and all of these kind of images that he uh, evokes through his, his own experience, um, but also in terms of kind of ideas around um, supportive practice and community and collaboration, which is very integral to, to the, the making of, of that show and, and what Tim spoke about. So we're really kind of happy to have um, Thompson and Anna and Sonia uh, and Tim with us to talk about some of these uh, issues a bit further and to kind of unpack them from uh, their own different perspectives. Um, and hopefully then we can kind of open up the conversation and really have uh, some uh, interesting conversations around um, these themes of collaboration and interdependence. Um, so what we're going to do is kind of, um, uh, there's two questions really that we want to kind of outline at the beginning um, that I'm going to kind of pose to, to all the speakers. The first question um, is how can collective approaches support the artistic practices of neurodiverse people? Um, and the second question or provocation is, how can supporting marginalized artists make a difference to individuals and communities? Um, so these are the kind of two kind of key questions that we're, we're gonna think about for the next 20 minutes. And I'm gonna go uh, between uh, all of our panelists and try to get their kind of perspective and take, and hopefully that will also give you a bit of an introduction to, to them. Um, and then we'll move on to a bit more of a kind of uh, responsive conversation and then there'll be lots of time for people to ask questions um, and uh, get feedback directly from from the speakers so um, I think we're going to start uh, with Thompson do you want to turn your mic on Thompson yeah, yeah bye. hi uh, Thompson hello how are you doing okay good good um, so me and Thompson go, we go way back, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thompson, you're, you're an artist and you work with, with Action Space. Yeah. Um, and um, I thought maybe just some people in the audience <laughs> might not know anything about Action Space. So I thought it might be, we could just start actually by you just telling us a little bit about uh, Action Space um, and who they are and, and, and what you do with them. Yeah, um, well, Action Space is an art project based in London that works with artists with learning disabilities. They have various projects all over London. 
And the one I go to is the one in central London, which I've been at the last 20 odd years now. So, and it's all varied, like with each artist. And um, they, they all do various bits of work. Some make things out of textiles, some like to paint, some like to draw. And it all comes from them as individuals, where, where the ideas come from. So, and with the help of like the facilitators, the artist facilitators, they sort of like help them, support them in a way that helps them create that work uh, as a body of work. So, yeah. Yeah, and you you work um, particularly with uh, an artist facilitator called Lisa Lisa yeah. Brown. Yeah. Um, and uh, we can also just for anyone who who hasn't already worked this out, but I think it's a bit obvious. Uh, Thompson's got some of his brilliant uh, paintings uh, behind him. Yeah, this um, is my work here. Yeah. yeah, and maybe we can we can sort of talk a little bit specifically about that in a second. But I thought it would be interesting in this uh, conversation where we're trying to think about collective approaches and support for neurodiverse artist practice. Um, can you tell us a bit about that relationship with Lisa? How how do you and Lisa work together? Um, I tend to like bounce ideas from her, and, and she help, and it helps me gain confidence with my ideas and how to develop those ideas. Um, and and it's also nice that because we're a group, a CDA group, we get to help each other in certain ways that that will benefit each other. So. So there is that kind of collective grouping as well as uh, individuals getting additional support. So, yeah. And and you've worked quite um, closely with with certain artists. I remember one of the the first conversations that we had was was at your exhibition at the South Bank uh, yeah. Centre, and it was a project called My My Life in London. Yeah. Um, and it was you and another artist called Ian uh, yeah. Warnas. Um, so is that kind of quite integral to your creative process to work uh, alongside other people and um, in collaboration as well as kind of on your own or how, how does that work? Um, it tends to work like that. I don't mind collaborating, you know I mean, with other people because it helps me, you know what I mean, evolve my ideas. But also I tend to like to work on my own occasionally, but it all depends on what sort of mood I'm in, whether I want to collaborate with somebody or work on my own, it all varies in between. So, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's sort of a process that allows you to kind of bounce ideas off, off one another. But then is there, is, I guess working with Lisa, there's some quite sort of direct support that she uh, kind of uh, provides in, in terms of the kind of the making of the work. Is there... So yeah, specific things that yeah, because uh, sometimes, or well, most of the time, when I come like for any session, um, I tend to bring in drawings that I've done at home and I show her, and we talk about them how we could develop those as an idea, like say for paintings or whatever. So, yeah, and then discuss it even further to see which which way I could go with that those ideas. Mm. Yeah. And and you work in a studio sort of environment with with action space and, and obviously there's a real parallel with uh sharif and uh tim talked a bit about how sharif's work was kind of produced um you know in that in the studio space and there's something really important for yeah for all artists but um particularly in in the kind of collective practice to be in the studio what what's the kind of atmosphere of the studio what does that give you as a as an artist a practitioner um I suppose it helps because when you've got other people working with you, whether they're your friends that you've known for a long time and that, you can really help each other out and, 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 and share the ideas that you have. And, um, and, and that's what I like about it mostly, that be able to share those ideas and, and how to put them forward as a body of work. And, and also I like the fact that you can... Um, work together in various ways you know we may not all do the same kind of work but there's there's like almost a similar link with each mm. work so it's kind of nice yeah yeah and and also to support each other as well and to praise each other and and to you know when someone's feeling a bit down we tend to help each other out if someone says so 
that's a rubbish draw. And I'll say to them, no, that's great. You know, that's, that's a good drawing. Keep working on it. You know, <laughs> let's develop it a bit more, you know? Mm. And I think, and I think that's also to do with like the lack of confidence that they have within themselves. And it's like that with all of us in that group as well. Sometimes we have that lack of confidence in ourselves thinking we can't do it, we can't do it. But deep down we know full well we can do it. It's just that we need that sense of motivation to push us to do it. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Mm. And, and it's been really transformational for you, hasn't it? Because, again, a little bit like Sharif, um, I know that your work is really rooted in an exploration of your identity and your heritage, yeah. and particularly kind of thinking about uh, your uh, West African, I think it's Ghanaian, your Ghanaian yeah, yeah, root. Yeah. Um, and actually those, those uh, maybe something that uh, in those images behind, your, your whole kind of visual language um, has almost kind of developed around uh, references to kind of um, traditional textiles. Yeah. Um, and so how, how, is that, how has that collective environment uh, allowed you to kind of um, explore those kind of sometimes really difficult personal kind of experiences? Has it, has it kind of really enabled that to happen or how, how does that work? Um, that tends to work where I, I tend to explore it a bit more because I've always been intrigued ever since I was little, like from my childhood, where I've always been intrigued of what my identity is, you know, and how it, uh, I question it from time to time. And, and that's one of the things, because of my grandparents, of who they are and, and what happened to them in the 50s, for instance, as an example, that it's made me realise what my heritage is all about, really. Yeah. So, um, so, so, yes, I did, I've been doing lots of drawings. Yeah, which is, I've got some examples here. Oh, yeah, show us. Which are these right. working on, working on. And this is all about, um, about my family heritage, what I just mentioned just a moment ago. And about my grandparents, which uh, can you bring them a bit closer to the camera, Tom? There we go. There we go. They're these are about my family heritage. About this is all about, you know, about what I don't know, about what happened in the fifties mm. like when you first came to this country and how you were badly treated. You know, there's things like that, and I've sort of explored that as well. Mm. I mean, not just about exploring them. Um, the brutality and the discrimination in, within the empire, but also what happened over here as well, from those that came over here, mm. like, like migrated, just like my granddad did. Um, and this is all about the story of the empire after a brief period of time, I can't remember when, when Did it you... collapsed. Yeah, yeah, when it collapsed, when it collapsed. You lift them up a little bit, Thompson. Oh, that's go. great, yeah, perfect. We lifted them, sorry, then how they collapsed how it collapsed over a period of time and mm. how, how it caused a lot of problems and, and there's always been that debate about empire. What does it actually mean in today's modern society? What does it represent now? You know? Mm. Does it mean anything? Does it was it you know, does it raise questions about whether it was a force of good or a force of bad? You know what I mean? Which I suppose is a question that will split opinion, but you know, but this this is like the joy in it talks about that in a way. Mm. Yeah, it's really, really interesting and really nice to hear about how, um, you know, you've been able to kind of uh, begin to unpack and, and deal with these really kind of complex, uh, sensitive yeah. and kind of personal uh, issues. We're going to come back, Thompson, um, to, I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to touch on these themes a bit more, but I wanted to um, move on to uh, Sonia. Okay. Um, and um, so thank, thanks, Thompson. Um, and I'm just going to invite Sonia to, to kind of turn your mic on um, and give us uh, your perspective on these, these two questions and provocations, really, around uh, collective approaches and supporting the artistic practices of neurodiverse people and the difference that that, that makes to individuals and, and communities. Thank you, Ali, and it's brilliant to be here. Thank you for inviting me to be on this amazing panel. Um, and I was also lucky enough to write a piece about um, Sharif's wonderful exhibition. So I've, I felt really 
involved in, in, in that, then that's been, been wonderful. So I'm very excited to be here. Um, and I've done a kind of classic autistic thing really, because I've sort of taken my brief very seriously. And um, I've written a little piece for each question. Um, so forgive me for reading out from a, a sheet of paper, but I, I need a script to read from. Um, and I, I'm going to ask Livy to put some links up as well, just that there are some visuals for people to look at, because I can know it can be quite heavy going when people just read off sheets of paper. So anyway, um, I think, thank you for asking these questions. I think they're both really deep and very complex and it's sort of, um, really got my mind going the last couple of days just thinking about them. I'm going to try and deal with them in order, but as you said earlier, Ali, they overlap really, and it's quite hard to unpick and untangle all of the issues involved, um, and obviously can't do it in five minutes. But I would like to talk mainly uh, for the first question about the importance of language. Um, so Libby, if you could put a link to my 2019 Nuno project um, for people to to click on and have a look at. That gives more details about my approach and my research findings about working across um, neurological types to level the playing field and, and create a project uh, for two different artistic networks. Um, I think that when we work collectively across neurological types, we can open up a dialogue and we can also challenge hidden assumptions. Collaborating allows us to consider what any artist might need to support their practice and how we can level up when we need something different from the currently assumed norm. Because we're all dependent on support in one way or another, but this is rarely acknowledged in the arts. So that's, that's my starting point always. Um, and I think we can be effective in understanding um, what we need and how to support one another across neurologies by focusing on social biases. Um, and it's really worth saying, as I often do, that there's no such thing as a neurodiverse individual, while we can be neurodiverse collectively. The term is often misused because we're all still learning to talk about neurological difference. However, it is important to try to use language as clearly as we can, even though it's in flux and our understanding is changing all the time. And Livy, if you want to, to scroll, so this is a PDF evaluation document from this project. If you want to scroll, it just gives people something to look at. There's some really lovely photographs as well, um, if you keep scrolling through. So why is it important to try to be clear about language? Because understanding and owning that we're neurodiverse collectively helps to decenter a dominant and extremely narrow perspective on what it means to be a cognitively valid, functioning and effective human being. So neurodiverse means all of us, and it refers to the wonderful and possibly infinite variety of neurological profiles among the human population. It's just that very many people never have to think about what kind of brain functioning they have because society has been organized around their needs. This always feels weird to me because I have to think about it all the time. Um, but I found that people of the neuro majority actually appreciate understanding themselves more and gaining more insight into their cognitive functioning when they work with me. I think we also need opportunities to experience and acknowledge that when we work across neurological types as a neurodiverse collective like Project Artworks, for example, we all win. It's often assumed that all the gains are one way when we're all enriched and in many ways, dependencies can occur across the board. 
this was one of the very powerful points of learning on the Nuno project. Talking about any need arising in the project as access can really open your eyes to how much we all require accommodations to take part in a group endeavour, often at different times and for different reasons. So I think our focus in working together across neurological types must be on removing barriers regardless of neurotype. And I think that's very levelling. Once you adopt this lens, you start to gain clarity. My modus operandi on the Nuno project that was wherever there was a barrier, no matter what that barrier might be, for absolutely anyone on the project, it had to be dismantled before we could move forward as a group. It took knowledge, skill, focus and attention, which makes it important to have a diverse pool of talent and experience to draw on. This to me defines a collective where each member is valued and can participate in ways which are meaningful and enabling, all brought about by a shared sense of purpose. I want to conclude in responding to this first question by sharing some words from a neurodivergent artist supported by Nuno about what it meant to them to be fully accommodated. They describe the project as both a life raft and a warm hug after years of exclusion and alienation. And then going on to how can supporting marginalized artists make a difference to individuals and communities. I think that gaining genuinely supportive opportunities can be transformational for us. The multiple barriers we face can't really be gone into in a forum like this. But it's worth saying that working holistically with us can make a huge difference because often the barriers can be many layered and complex. This often requires bespoke, responsive and relational methods I've found. Often building trust and establishing preferred communication styles have to come first. Making the work itself can often be an area of greatest strength and a powerful motivation in our lives. But many artists will have been denied the opportunity for professional development, despite having a very rich and often well-honed practice, like Sharif's, for example. If you don't have access to higher production values, how can you produce more obviously quality work? How can you scale up works or reach audiences at all? if you have a neurologically based challenge in the area of spatial awareness or communication. It won't mean you're not talented. It would just mean you need help with those things to realize your vision. And having an effective network of collaborators who can help identify what you need and organize that help with you can be vital to progression. But in my view, it's not just a case of giving us a leg up so we can succeed in conventional terms and fit in with a system that is fundamentally ill-fitting and will remain so without change. Think of all the effort involved in trying to swim against the tide and in supporting us to swim against systems that are stacked against us and not made for us. So I think that working across neurologies is an opportunity to learn from each other and find ways to break out of the narrow frameworks that have been created for developing and platforming artistic practice more generally. We can all benefit from trying new ways to think about our work, develop projects, make work, share process and exhibit works. And I'm currently experimenting with this in my new project called Neurophototherapy. Um, and if you'd like to share a link to that, maybe, um, or people can just click on it because I'm, I'm nearly done now. Um, I think we need new templates for what constitutes practice if we're going to learn to value and understand works beyond a narrow spectrum of lived experience. I think this will need to involve a greater emphasis on the value of the creative process and creating opportunities for genuine neurodiverse collaboration.
in all areas of the arts. And I think this can only serve to enrich us all. Thanks, Sonia. That was that was brilliant and just a really kind of yeah, amazingly articulate um, take through um, this really important argument about um, that neurodiversity is, is a collective um, thing. And actually, by um, looking at it collectively and thinking about this term that you used about leveling um, and thinking about equity and, and maybe rights um, to, to kind of practice and to be involved in and at the heart of arts and culture, I, th I think is something that we can maybe develop a bit further as uh, you know in, in the next part of the conversation. But thank you for that for that um, contribution. It's really fantastic. Um, we're gonna we're gonna move on to Anna. Are you are you ready, Anna? Are you are you there? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. Hey, great. <laughs> um, so Anna, yeah, um, you know, uh, let let us uh, have have a bit of your take of of how you kind of see these these uh, questions and these issues around collectivity um, and and practice. Cool. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Firstly, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ali, and thank you, Thompson and Sonia, for handing the mic. Um, bear with me. I'm incredibly nervous and anxious. Uh, in fact, my legs, I can't quite feel them right now. <laughs> my heart is thumping in my chest. So, um, yeah, don't mind me if I get stuttery. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, my mum. Uh, who is going to be supporting me or has already been supporting me through the whole day um, and will not be finishing anytime soon because yeah. I need help <laughs> now as well. Yeah, um, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I can do it properly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great, it's not going to work. Screen. Yeah, it's gonna no, it's working. Okay, good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, my practice is quite, uh, yeah. it's just very broad. Um, I, I do work um, around disability culture in the UK, around my autism, um, and um, I also am a, a project manager facilitator and I was the founder of the Autography Project, which is currently hosted at Photo Fusion in Brixton, uh, but not IRL because obviously COVID. Um, <laughs> um, and also I'm an autistic artist and I, I, I have a I make work and I also do international and national um, training around um, neurodiverse inclusion as well so um yeah uh the main kind of theme of my work is access um and it's fitting given that to to accomplish my own access um to being an artist and making work um i have a um an army <laughs> of support uh that helps that take place um, which I would also like to point out as a bit of a disclaimer is a very privileged position to be in um, because not many people have it. Um, so some of the things that I struggle with that I need support with in my artistic practice slash my daily life um, are things like traveling. So if I want to you know go to say i wanted to go to autograph to see sharif's show <laughs> um i would need someone to come with me yeah got it yeah <laughs> i would need someone to come with me um Tatum, yeah um i uh, i would need help with safety um and organizing the whole thing making sure i was going to be on time i mean this this all this translates to every aspect of my life um, so basically what we're looking at are things that we would call executive functioning. Um, so those are the things that I find really difficult. One of the biggest things um, that I get from my support 
network is probably reassurance um, and that tends to be the kind of pivoting factor on things going well or not going very well. So um, I'd like to share with you um, a piece of um, work that I undertook through the help of Project Artworks. Um, they did a, a three year program called Explorers, which they are currently going to be doing another one of. There's going to be an Explorers 2, which is very exciting. Um, but really, this was the first opportunity uh, that I'd ever had to, um, to join the plate of the art world. Um, and it was incredibly exciting and cool. Um, but really, the thing that's extraordinary about this process that I don't think is talked about enough is the, the way in which an application process, an open call is set up. Uh, to be inclusive. That's not just for me and my autism, but for multiple people with multiple different access barriers. Um, so that's something I'm very interested about generally, especially after, um, um, especially after, um, sorry, I got distracted by the chat there. <laughs> um, uh, I can't remember what I was saying, but yes, uh, this, yeah, this was, um, so how is this collaborative? So, yeah, so, okay, so in making this piece of artwork, which was called This Gives You a Score of Zero, um, there's a cracking review uh, by Disability Arts Online. Sorry, Libby, I didn't give you that link. <laughs> um, so maybe you can <laughs> furiously dig it for me off the internet. Um, but basically, um, I was very, very lucky. I uh, got the opportunity to work with someone called Claire Wern from who was at that time at PhotoWorks. Um, and she was my compass to understanding this commission process that I had received um, and breaking down all of the elements that it was going to take to end up in a gallery with a realized piece of work and understand the process as a whole ahead of the fact. So there was enough time to plan and prepare. Um, another person that became completely integral is Becky Warnock, um, someone who I would definitely call a mentor um, in the arts who uh, selflessly many times will give me guidance and advice um, around how to navigate the arts industry and helping set my expectations um, so that I then can thrive in, you know, in, in any creative environment um, that I'm unfamiliar with, um, that comes with the territory. <laughs> um, Another person is Richard. Uh, during that project, he was my printer. Um, I'd never had a printer before. Uh, I'm, I'm a sculptor and many other things, but photography was a new realm um, in terms of creating a final product. So yeah, it was fantastic. And Richard similarly understood my needs and my difficulties because we had got to know each other through doing other pieces of work. And that really was, again, very important when it came to him understanding the best way for me to communicate my needs and how I wanted the work to look. Um, another person who was incredibly important, uh, dare I say, is the word access to work. <laughs> um, you know, for people who don't know what that is, um, it's a government scheme uh, to uh, help support people with additional needs um, in employment. So I was a real uh, curveball for their department and have been for quite a long time mm. as a self-employed artist um, with autism and I'm sure I've crashed their system. Um, but um, I, I, I'm very lucky to receive uh, support from AS Mentoring 
which is an uh, a um, um autism thank you <laughs> yeah autism specific support into employment so that can be job seeking um or support working, support working um placements mm. um workshops mm. a really great organization i've been receiving support from them for about six years now so um yeah and that is a long-term relationship that i have with support workers laura isn't working with me anymore she's gone on to leonard cheshire to change 100 and we're very proud of her but we're still best friends so <laughs> um yeah <laughs> and of course the people that are not on this slide who were very present which is why um sat here with me now uh was my family as well um i don't receive social care support that's another conversation for another time. Um, but my family do a lot for me in terms of um, helping me manage my workload, um, recalling ideas and random things I'll say that apparently are actually quite important later down the line when it comes to developing a piece of work. Um, so yeah, just gonna, there we go. I can't, I don't know, I can't gauge what I'm doing for time. Yes, you're going to run out of time. Right. So you might want to talk, yeah, <laughs> okay. if you want to talk about the second question, um, which is, you know, how, how does, how do, I can't turn this off, how can supporting marginalised artists, how can supporting someone like you make a difference to the individuals you have in your Okay, yeah. so um, I also deliver, um, let me just move forward. Um, so the Autography Project, which I founded in 2016, with support from the incredible Lizzie King, who's no longer there, but the big uh, lottery fund. <laughs> the big lottery fund, yeah. Um, um, we did. Um, what is it? What you... It's a project for adults who are um, over 18 and um, identify as having autism uh, or an autism spectrum condition um and we use visual art to make visual communication and to express ourselves and explore our autistic identities together um because the stigma and self stigma is rife <laughs> um so yeah uh this this um translated no this um was amazingly delivered in, in the form of an online Zoom project at the beginning of this year um, from doing an emergency appeal for funds to do a C19 project um, because yeah you're already dealing with um, a community struggling with isolation and then when you you know layer COVID on top of that um, I'm sure I don't really need to go into too much detail about how that could be really dangerous. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, so we delivered um, a series of workshops um, using a uh, box of materials. Um, and um, it turned out that the project was not only a lifeline as described by four of the five participants um but also for me it became um something which uh it, it it was a lifeline for me too um and we were able to collectively support each other um especially through the information that was always coming through and changing um and coming up with kind of problem solving around how to navigate being out in society when we had to be and what we should be doing when, how, and and who with, <laughs> etc. Um, yeah. Uh, Anna. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I'm way over, aren't I? Okay. Yeah. No. 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 It's 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 fine. Um, I I just thought um that was that was fantastic. I just thought maybe. Uh, you, you can always come back to, to some of that, um, you know, shortly as we kind of move a bit more into the conversation. But it was really, really interesting to hear actually in all of that detail um, what those support structures that you've 
been able to build around yourselves and what you've built for others through autography um, looked like? Because I think for a lot of people, as Sonia was mentioning, and as, as you said, Anna, um, you know, maybe a lot of people who, you know, might not think of themselves as neurodiverse um, or having a disability just don't often acknowledge uh, the support that they do receive or are not aware of how much support is needed for some people to take part in cultural life or in social life or everyday uh, life. So it was really, really important to hear how you kind of laid that out. Um, and we'll definitely come back to, to some of what you, what you raised. Um, I just wanted to, I thought it would be really good just to bring Tim in um, quickly, because I know, Tim, that you um, spoke a lot in the video, <laughs> so you don't have to go over any of that ground again. But um, I was thinking through all of, all of those presentations, Sonia and Anna and, and Thompson, um, this kind of focus on the fact that you're making work, you're making art, but you're also making relationships. Um, and actually there's, there's two really important things that, that are being made. And, and your relationship with Sharif was very long-term, developed over a number of years. Um, and one of the things I've always found really touching looking at your collaborations is the way that you name the works. You, you kind of write things like Tim and Sharif made a film. Um, and there's something really kind of, uh, there's an equality to that. And, and I just thought it'd be really interesting to hear if you had any more kind of like comments to say about that process of making relationships and how you do that at Project Artworks, because I, I think it is quite special. You're on mute, Tim. Yeah, got it. Okay. <laughs> Um, thanks everyone, that was really interesting to hear. I feel like a bit of a tourist uh, now talking, but um, yeah, like you say, Ali, the work is all about relationships and because um, at Project Artworks, through the Creative Programme and through the Sport Collective, we work with lots of people who don't necessarily self-advocate or identify as artists. So the work is all about um, you know, the relationships that are, are made during, uh, in the studio and a lot of the time that the art kind of exists within that process of collaboration. And the term sort of collective approach is actually, it sounds kind of the opposite to the sort of person-centered approach that we kind of, uh, that, that, we, that we kind of operate with at Project Artworks that actually um, all the, um, What's really important, I guess, is that people make work without necessarily kind of aspiring to the sort of uh, neurotypical trajectory of, a, of an artist or professional development. So the work um, has lots of other kind of functions, I guess, and I think that the collaborations between some of the artists, makers that come and work here alongside the facilitating artists uh, is like really crucial and actually the work kind of exists in these conversations that are formed through the creation of work and actually doesn't really exist outside of that and what what's left from that is this kind of trace of an experience uh, and that's uh, that and that's kind of one way of working that although we work also of course with lots of people who are very autonomous about the way they their practice and do have uh, um, you know, professional development aspirations that are, that are much more typical. But I think that, yeah, it's just important to acknowledge that there are lots of different ways of making work and lots of ways in which it can, uh, um, well, lots of ways that it's really important to people. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I love what you just said about trace of an experience i think it, it's a it's it's a kind of really um beautiful way of, of putting it um, um i'm i'm i don't want to kind of monopolize this so sonia anna and thompson if there are things that kind of have been sparked off as you've been listening to other uh presentations what 
Tim just said, if you wanted to build on that, um, do kind of let me know and I can always kind of um, feel that. Sonia, you've, you've, you're waving your hand furiously. So <laughs> please, please do. Just, just... Me, me. Yeah, me. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that it was so fascinating hearing you all and um, seeing the film. And I was just thinking about what you were saying just now, Tim, and how this is a real issue for professional artists who are neurodivergent as well, because I think we do have aspirations for professional development, but we are also making um, in ways sometimes that are similar to the ways that you're describing, which are just about embodying our practice and making traces. And that's actually one of the barriers we find, I think, because some of us are not speaking the same language around what it takes to climb this ladder, you know, to, to get opportunity. And so you need, the, you need all this kind of um, professional jargon and the understanding about networking and all these things decoded for you by people who, you know, have the skill and the patience and the knowledge to do that for you. And I think it's just like a colossal endeavor. And it's something that I have been helped with in the past, which has helped my career progression. It's something that I've passed on to other artists who I've mentored. Um, and I think it's essential, but I'm far more interested these days in actually trying to change the way we think about practice and trying to elevate some of these practices which are more about you know the, the moment of contact the work that's created through relating and relationship and I think also that I can't speak for all neurodivergent artists I can't you know I, I always find it uh, it's not helpful to generalize but um, the but a lot of us, I think, feel that we relate through our work. That is how we make relationships, because making relationships head on in a very kind of neurotypical way is too challenging for us. It's not it's not our preferred style. We like to be alongside people often. And making artwork is perfect. For that, you know, um, and I think it is about having parallel lived experiences which if we can communicate about um, through our work it's really it's really enriching for for all of us I mean I learn a lot through working with um, artists of all kinds you know so I just wanted to pick up on that Tim I think it's really interesting point I wonder if yeah Thompson oh I was gonna I was actually gonna bring you in there Thompson but you put your hand up so go go for it don't even need yeah, yeah I, 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 I see what Sonia's saying, but there's another flip side to that as well, which has been overlooked, which is that it's also about a form of expression as well. And that's what most people, that's what most artists do anyway, don't they? They express themselves in so many ways that interprets what the world is like around them. And, I was, and it's the same with any artist, whether they're disabled or not, it's the same kind of process that we all have as artists. And I think that's the most fundamental thing that we all have to try and look at, as well as any other aspect, you know? Instead of it just being, well, this person's disabled, they're making work that's like this, and it's describing as this. But it's also, it can be also like, in a form of storytelling as well. Because don't forget, you know, artists, you know, they always used to say, art oh, is about telling stories. So it's kind of, in that side of sense as well and, and I think those are the things that should be looked at as well as all the other aspects uh, yeah. Anna go go for it I just wanted to um to ask a question to to the other panelists actually and um ask because Thompson what you just said is absolutely true that's what you said too, Sonia, it's both true. And I'm almost in my head, I'm seeing like this scales that are like trying to balance between, you know, what we want to do and what, or we don't even know what we want to do, us being in our art flow. And then all the things that we have to um, put in place, navigate, 
other people need to put in place for us like how that's then made possible and i just wanted to ask you both what's that scale look like for you both you know how how out of balance how much effort do you have to put into you know making yourself um in a position that you can be an artist making art <laughs> um versus um having to augmentate everything to enable you to do that well well for me personally i can't talk for any other artists i have to talk to myself here but um for me personally i do it in a way that that expresses how how i look at the world and how it makes sense to me and, and the only way i do that is by making it all visual and and, that, and that's the way to really understand the world as as we all know the world is complicated it's awkward and we can't all understand it because <laughs> it's always changing and evolving and art is a way that you can use as a vehicle to understand those complexities in, within the world and, and and that's that's the most brilliant thing about being an artist because you can understand it in that sense instead of getting into the nitty-gritty the complexity of what life's about and that's the best way to I suppose it's a good way to describe it. So it's good to be able to make sense of it in that sense. So, yeah. do you, Thompson, do you, do you feel, um, and, and I guess others can, can respond to this as well, do you feel like the support kind of structure that you have of the studio, um, of, of Action Space, Lisa, um, do you feel like that um, enables you to not have to think so much about support and about all the things that you can't do and it allows you that space to just think about your self-expression or, or just make your work do you do you feel like uh, yeah it, yeah 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 i do feel that that is that it's good to be able to be part of a studio where there is that support structure which enables me to develop and progress and evolve as an artist as well as working with other people like my peers for instance you know, so there's a mixture of both, I'll say. So it's kind of, I think that's important for any project or any art project that anyone's part of, that they have that kind of structure within, otherwise it won't work. Mm. And, I think, and I think the more we advocate that more out there, the more people get to understand and make sense of what we were trying to say on that level. Yeah. Mm. Because it, it, it was really making me think about um, something that you wrote in your article in the blog post on the Autograph website, Sonia, um, about the different ways that we see the support structures that an artist like Andy Warhol had with the factory or Damien Hirst had with his factory. Although apparently he's just sacked loads of people that work for him because of the pandemic. So not quite as much of a support structure as before but the, the kind of different values that we attach to that kind of support, fabrication, which goes all the way back to the Renaissance. And, you know, um, you know it's is, is a massive art historical lineage and the kind of support structures that um, neurodivergent artists have. That there does seem to be, to use Anna's kind of weight balance metaphor, a kind of imbalance there in the way that that's seen. Yeah, I think I think there is a complete imbalance, um, and I'm tempted to use the word hypocrisy actually, but that feels like quite a powerful word, um, and maybe I'll reserve that for for another blog or something. But um, I think that um, it's sort of like it. It's that these things are very hidden because it's just assumed that that's normality. It's just assumed that that because people very often don't have to think about it. You know, it's just part of their daily lives that they'll they'll just have those structures in place. That is part of an artist's practice. Um, whereas if you need something that's a bit outside of that norm, it starts to be seen as an accommodation, or, or that person needs a lot of support. You know, we've got to do something special for them. Um, and I just think it's not, it's not very honest, really. And I think we do need to be more honest and more open 
about um, how much support is needed for a practice generally. And actually the pandemic has shown that for a lot of, a lot of artists, you know, um, and I think it's, it really has been a moment where we can maybe start to, you know, just consider some of these inequities and just how very hard it is for freelance artists, you know, generally. Um, and I, I, I do think, Anna, about these scales. And for me, it's a constant battle. And I make gains and I make progress. And then I, I meet a challenge and I realise that my disability is never going to go away. That is my lived reality. Um, and I just think it's very, it is very hard actually for freelance artists as well who are outside of supported studios. Because you do have to negotiate access for work, then you've got to, I think your access to work provision is brilliant, Anna, by the way. I have access to work too, yeah. and it is way more patchy, so I think I need some tips from you about... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. no, no promises like you know, I no, think no. it's always and it's hard isn't it for people who are not yeah. part of that UK disability culture who know what access to work is and what a bun fight it is and incredibly how I mean we talk about imbalances in terms of I mean I, I hate to say it but it's a lottery you know every time you apply for access to work you don't know who you're going to get to talk to you don't know who you uh, the something quite traumatic happened with my access to work about two years ago um which was <laughs> which was uh my support got um uh cancelled because they didn't understand my tax return um so i went from having support every day to having none um and it was literally like someone had turned everything i'd carefully been professional development wise carefully been curating and placing on shelves and tweaking and perfecting and you know it was almost like someone had literally just bopped the shelf and everything fell off and broke and i have and i had to repair it and put it all back on again and that meant that i lost so much time of just being an artist and getting to just do what I wanted to do and that was coming from you know this provision which is part of a systemic you know way of leveling the playing field and it completely it it blew my playing field up <laughs> um so yeah I, but also I, I i wanted to just also say uh in response to what you were saying thompson about you know how integral your studio uh experience is and having that sense of community and support and you know um that's still something that i'm desperately seeking um and you know i, I do i think that um it is hard like especially i've because of covid I'm, I'm now living up in the north just outside of hull um so now trying to rebuild my awareness of services where those things are how to access them and uh, yeah but um i think it's very important having a supportive studio and workspace environment where you can connect with people who are going through similar experiences of the need for a collective approach. Tim, you were, I think you put your hand up there, didn't you? Um, I just wanted to um, say that I love uh, your motivation behind the, the way you make work, um, Thompson, and the sort of purity of that, and that's just amazing. And, and actually, you know, we work at Project Artworks, we work with lots, we work with individuals, but we also work with all the systems of support around that individual, because the idea is actually to create an environment where we can kind of reverse that power dynamic. And that happens like all the time, actually, in, in the studio practice, in within the community of Project Artworks, which it is. Um, 
that kind of reversal of that power dynamic of support. And I just think about when we went to Scotland to make uh, the film uh, Illuminate the Wilderness, where we went with um, six uh, people, six individuals from uh, neurodivergent artists from the uh, creative program here, their families, support teams, uh, filmmakers, artists, and actually, when we were there, it was we were kind of living in the, this sort of itinerant kind of community. And but what was really interesting was actually the people that needed the support were not the people who traditionally might be expected to. They were actually all of uh, us essentially. And and there was a real sort of and, and you know so it's it's all it's a two way thing actually. This idea of support, you know, it's not always something that's about kind of you know being given and it's that's something that's really important to recognize i think and actually in all the relationships we have with individuals that we work with that is that is something that's really a really important place to get to and recognize yeah it's, i think it's such an important point and um i love that in in the film tim when you talked about um how kind of working with sharif has kind of made you recognize things about yourself and 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 your own experience and, and processes and um and it takes us you know to the to that word in the title um interdependence um which you know I, I think is is something that we can probably think about lots lots more and kind of unpack more um sonia i saw that you you wanted to kind of come in and, and build on what tim tim was saying yeah i did i just wanted to agree completely about um the surprises that can come when you work um, across neurologies in who needs the most support in any given situation and we had exactly the same situation and actually with, with the Nuno project and actually people coming forward and talking about their needs in completely different ways because there was permission to do so and I think that's the thing as well I think actually um, culturally maybe before the pandemic post pandemic i think we're getting better at talking about need um emotional needs and vulnerabilities and you know the need for support i think that's improved massively you know you can now talk about mental health for example in all kinds of meetings whereas in the past it just wouldn't have been possible um but i do think it is it's like a myth that um you know uh, for want of a better word, abled or, or neurotypical people do not have their own complexities and, and do not have, you know, real challenges sometimes. And I think it's really about being human and just being about compassionate, really. And it was quite interesting that um, one of the non neurodivergent artists on the Nuno project um, thought that the project had this real ethos of kindness. And I thought that was lovely because they weren't thinking in terms of disability or access or or any of these other words which might you know you might associate with being marginalized. They were thinking more in terms of uh, you know this is just people being kind to each other and being considerate. You know what's what's so radical about that? That shouldn't be hard, should it? <laughs> Um, it's, a, it's a great point. Anna, but before you, you come in there, I just, um, because we've got about um, 13 minutes before uh, this, we have to bring this, unfortunately, to a close because it's been a fascinating conversation and, and opened up so many other things that we could talk about. Um, I just wanted to remind people that you can put questions into the chat. Um, and there are a couple of questions there that I'm going to put to, to all of the panelists after Anna has has uh, responded and made her her uh, follow up that she was going to. Oh, um, hang on, I might have forgotten it. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to you. Oh no, sorry. Uh, no, no, it's fine. Uh, no, 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 Yes, yeah, Sonia, I just wanted to ask you a question about the Nuno project. As a fellow project manager, um, trying to build some sort of <laughs> um, sustainable support <laughs> for artists 
who have support needs. Um, so I've been running the the autography C19 group past the end of our project finish um, because of the importance of it and that is now unfunded and is just done on a voluntary basis um, and you know I, I just wanted to ask the question about the way in which these things are set up so these amazing initiatives they all require funding and when the funding is gone you know that's yet another cliff edge um that we're potentially like you know part of and i just you know i'm sure that everyone has a, a certain amount of experience with that and you know i think that's really hard as well in terms of creating these collective approaches to supporting people long term and what that takes and then obviously but how that practically is possible as well so that's I've just added another question <laughs> which probably wasn't very helpful um, well, no, I, th I think I think it is, and it, it, the thing it's actually really connected. I would say to um, a question um, from from Helen um, Robson, who's who's asked um, if there's any advice of how isolated neurodivergent artists like myself navigate through that gateway to find the support structures and networks within our own local community. So, I guess your quest your your question on top of that anna was kind of how do we deal with the cliff edges of when those support structures are withdrawn or kind of the rug is is pulled out so um do, do any of uh, there's been some uh things that have been posted in the chat with particular bits of advice but just putting it to you as the the panel are there are there is there like one uh kind of top bit of advice that you you might uh Give give to Helen or um, I'm happy happy to jump in and quickly um, talk about Anna's point as well. Um, mm. So I think that from my own experience, it's really important to try and find people um, who have similar challenges, and for that you need to be visible, which can be challenging because it can be very stigmatizing. So it's kind of all part of a process that seems to happen to a lot of us. I didn't know Anna existed. And then I was very excited to find Anna and realized that she was doing, you know, her own project uh, projects and was, you know, developing her skills as a project um, lead as I was and, and, you know, creating projects around our own needs. And I remember in an email to me, Anna, when you first approached me, you said, I seem to create projects around my you know what i need where the gaps are what i discover is missing and i see this as a pattern now all over the country and it's probably global of neurodivergent individuals having to organize at grassroots level um, so my top piece of advice is try to find people like you try to build community um, you're getting some good advice about some of the places that you can look for people in your local area which is great and then you know it is possible to organize but Anna's point about how hard it is to sustain that and how difficult current funding structures are in terms of making you go through a massive process each time you want to do a piece of work uh, you know it just isn't it isn't sustainable so the Nuno project was a was a kind of two-part project it's now in the archive it's part of my portfolio of things that i've created and done um, i'm in contact with all the artists all the artists are thankfully thriving and doing really interesting things um, and i still mentor some of them um, but it's not funded and if i were to take that on it would be colossal and i wouldn't be able to do all the other things that i need to do um, so I'm actually developing, my new project is actually developing a more remote 
um, model of self-support, creative self-support strategies for um, late diagnosed neurodivergent people. Because I've realized that I just do not have the capacity. I am not an organization. I can't, you know, <laughs> I can't run a project uh, that is supporting a, a whole bunch of other people without a team. I'd need to assemble a team, you know, it's kind of like, it, it just gets to a point where it's really difficult. And so how does the sector support people like Anna and I to do what is really valuable, invaluable work? And that is something I would really like to ask. Just, yeah, just to add to that, you mm. know, the evidence is incredibly compelling. I mean, if you compare all the outcomes between our two projects, plus if anyone's out there tonight, <laughs> please come in touch with us. You know, there, there is apps because of the paucity um, of the resources and the social kind of, you know, um, design. sorry, design. Yeah, the social design. Um, that's where these projects are, you know, becoming very critical places for people to add to their kind of lives. And it's hard, you know, because you want to offer a long term commitment given the needs of the majority. But, you know, you're one resource <laughs> and you can be, um, yeah, used up quite quickly. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, thank, thanks, thanks, Anna and, and Sonia for the for those answers. There, there's something that it, it was making me think about actually, and it was a, it was a little bit um, based on this question that Helen um, has written specifically to Thompson, uh, where she's asked, um, "Do you make art for yourself and or to communicate your life experience with others?" Um, and obviously, that was a big kind of part of what Tim um, was sort of sharing with us about. Sharif and just Thompson just before you, you answer it my kind of connection between the two was thinking about whether you as as artists and, and as panelists and people working um, in collaboration whether you feel like the kind of um, explosion if you like of or the, the, the status of artwork and uh, practice dealing with issues around identity and collectivity uh, maybe we could point to you know uh, the fact that project artworks have been nominated for the turner prize for example and that alongside a whole load of other collectors do we think that this kind of uh, conversation that's happening in the arts at the moment is going to make a change that might kind of allow uh, artists like thompson and like anna to be able to kind of garner more support because there's more visibility for it do we do we buy do we buy into that um, uh, Thompson, sorry. No, I don't buy into that. I think that's kind of false. You know what I mean? And um, and the reason I say it's false is because you get that. No matter whether you like an artist that works in a studio setting or if you have work on an artist that's in a gallery, it's all the same. Where it's always like there's a label, a pigeonhole. You know what I mean? You're classed as this sort of artist, as this sort of artist when they don't see the human element of that, of that person. They're artists, yeah, but they don't see the human element in, within that. And that's the thing that's missing, that gets overlooked time and time again. And then maybe we should try and go back to that instead of just, you know what I mean, playing with the idea of they just, this type of artist or this type of artist. Instead of labeling that person of the type of artist they are, why don't we go back to the human element of why they make the work? And they explain the work, whether it's a personal story or what have you. So, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Anna, you're uh, you're you're desperate to come in there. I can feel I can feel you almost <laughs> coming through the screen. <laughs> Love it, Thompson. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And I just wanted to add to that um, a fantastic documentary, which is free on the iPlayer for you to watch at the moment is called Kusama Infinity. And it has all of those themes about recognizing the reality of power dynamics, 
about the context to do with race, gender, and support needs, uh, and you know, operating as a vulnerable artist uh, with mental health issues and complexities. And um, it, yeah, it's free to watch on the iPlayer. It's available for another thirteen days. So if anyone can check it out, it's yeah, it's a pretty great watch. Tim, I wonder if, if you've got anything to sort of say about that, just because you've, you've been involved in these, these conversations around collectives and, and its kind of currency within, within the kind of cultural world at the moment, art and culture. And, you know, maybe you could respond a bit because Chris Miller's uh, kind of put a comment into the chat there about how there's a problem with the word collective, it can mean what you want it to mean better to explain how you work together, not just use the words we are a collective. So I'm wondering if, if there's anything that you feel like has come out of this uh, recent kind of mediation on the idea of a collective and the, that currency at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Chris is right about the term collective. And I think that we're, it's something that is kind of new actually to Project Artworks to some extent, this idea of collective. I think we're, we're an organization and a community. And I think the, the collective term just really reflects our, you know, the importance of acknowledging the, the sort of the reversal of that sort of traditional power dynamic associated with kind of organizations like us like we are just, you know we we see that everything we do is determined by the neurodivergent uh, people and families that we work with in terms of whether i think that there's going to be this kind of uh, sort of uh, equal acceptance of uh work and all of a sudden the sort of rejection of the sort of intellectualization of art and the critics i think there's probably quite a long way to go but i think that you know what is really interesting actually is that we at project artworks we don't really separate out um our work to sort of improve outcomes for people in social care and the sort of activism of our work from the sort of traditional art making processes like paintings on walls or making films so I hope that actually that it is that it does signal a sort of a change towards towards that actually towards the sort of recognition of uh, the need for diversity in all our lives because you know it's only through that diversity that we really understand our own lives. So I think I hope that there is a change towards. Um, you know, this idea of sort of repositioning people in the eyes of society and this idea of kind of, you know, you know, sort of bringing, bringing groups that are marginalised into the heart of sort of cultural and civic life. And I think that hopefully it signals a kind of the start of that. But I, yeah, I think, I think as I agree with um, Thompson in, in many ways, you know, I think that there is still this sort of idea of, um, this kind of there is still an inequality obviously uh in the way that work is presented and labeled and uh i think there's still a long way to go but you know as he spoke about the way that he makes work for me anyway who i'm not an intellectual and i'm not you know i'm i'm kind of more of an art, artist of instinct myself he you know, it sums up for me what's really important about making work and what I find really important about the way Sharif makes work, etc. Is this, is this kind of honesty, this sort of reflection of truth, of experience, of life, of understanding? And I think that's that to me is what's really exciting. And I don't really um, sort of, I don't really sort of take, I don't know, I don't appreciate necessarily kind of what critics would think or say anyway, it doesn't mean too much to me. <laughs> so uh, that's my, uh, my take. Mm. Yeah, and it, <clears throat> it's kind of, it's almost like we've come all the way back to, you know, 1948 and kind of universal declaration of, of rights. And, um, you know, the, the idea of uh, everyone having the right to freely participate 
in the cultural life of the community and actually we're still trying <laughs> uh, and all of your work is still kind of a, a process of trying to actually make that a kind of live uh, reality um, we have gone three minutes over so i have to apologize to everyone um in the audience um sorry about that but it was an incredible conversation and, and there's just i feel like we could probably do another one uh tomorrow and kind of cover you know all of the other things that we didn't kind of quite get to and you know anna's was making me think about imagining new structures and actually if we kind of how can we dismantle ableism and whiteness and all, all of these things so we could have gone we could have gone so far and I'm sure we can carry these conversations on. Um, but just to kind of finish off, um, I'd just like to give a really big thanks to Sonia and Anna and Thompson and Tim for being on the panel and Anna's mum, who has been ever present there, uh, as well as uh, Omoyeli and Rebecca, who've been doing a brilliant interpretation um, for us, which is really important for this conversation to kind of uh, go as far and be as accessible as we can make it. Um, so yeah, obviously this is the point at a Zoom kind of event where we can't all hear the beautiful ripple of, of applause, but we can just, hopefully everyone out there can just be doing some applause for you guys. Um, and um, yeah, you've got uh, everyone who hasn't seen Sharif's show, um, there's a bit more time before it comes down. Um, it's a really great show and I, I really recommend it if you uh, are able to get to autograph in we're based in Shoreditch so if you can get to it that would be fantastic but um, yeah I just want to bid everyone uh, farewell and good night and thanks so much for joining us um, and see you soon cheers <laughs>